God in heaven, we come to you. The whole reason we're here this morning is to meet with you. It's to sit at your feet, to hear your heart speak to ours. So God, we pray as we open up your word this morning that your spirit would guide us, that it would change us, that whatever walls we have built up to keep us from hearing you, that you would knock those down so we could hear clearly. Pray that you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear and our feet to live out the truths we discover this morning. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Uh, We are continuing our series called Flipped. And last week, Pastor Brian did a faithful job uh, expositing the passage for us as we looked at what it was to be a peacemaker and living a life with peace, in peace, and peace around us. And he did a great job doing that. And this morning, we're going to dive into Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. And before we actually dig into the text, I remember as a kid that there were a couple books that had come out. And some of you might remember, there's a first one of these, it was kind of like a challenge where in this book it has these 3D pictures where the 3D pictures look like a bunch of nothing. It was all pixels. But if you stared closely at the picture, you could kind of see into the picture. You guys ever remember those when they came out? Okay. Were those not the most aggravating thing? Because I would have friends that are like, oh yeah, what you looking at? And I'm like, this 3D picture. And he's like, oh, I see dolphins. I see penguins, I see a submarine, and I see a big Ferris wheel. What do you see? I see page 98 in the book. That's what I see. Like, well, you just got to put the book close to your face. And as you get it real close, you pull it back. And I'm like, I got nothing. I'm just smelling the pages. That's all I got right now. And I was aggravating. But finally, that moment when you were able to see in, you were like, ah, there it is. I see it. Well, there was another book that came out in the early 90s. And I remember this is one of the, it was an exciting book, but I remember at the same time it was aggravating, it was annoying, it was frustrating, it was a pain. It, okay, I'll just stop. But I'll, I'll show you a picture. How many of you guys remember this dude up here on the screen? Where's Waldo? Remember that guy? Yeah. The author's like, hey guys, I'll give you a challenge. Just find Waldo. I'm like, how hard could that be? That guy's a little goofy guy. He's got a cap on. He's going to be easy to find. So the author puts scenes like this on the screen, and it's like, find Waldo. Now, is that fair? Everything looks like Waldo. A shoe looks like Waldo. A blanket looks like Waldo. And it's like, where is this guy hidden? Waldo, where are you? And I would look and look and get aggravated. Sometimes I'd want to light the book on fire or tear the pages out. And so... As you look at that, I mean, can anybody in here, can anybody, have you found Waldo yet? I mean, everything looks exactly the same. Well, thankfully, guys, I won't keep you guys aggravated for the whole entire service. I will show you where Waldo is. So I'll show you the next one. Here's Waldo. You guys see him? He's hanging out next to a judge. Like, what's the judge doing at the beach? It's weird. He's got his whole court scene out there. It's like, what are you doing? Uh, But Waldo's here. And... The difficulty about these things is the guy purposely designed it because he wanted you to have to really look for Waldo. But he made everything else blend in, made Waldo blend in and look exactly the same. And and you might say, Brad, why are we talking about Waldo? What does this have to do with our text for today? Well, the reason why we're talking about Waldo is because there is something, an epidemic that is happening among God's people and his churches in America and across the world is that you have God's people who call themselves disciples of Jesus. They call themselves Christians. They put the fish on the, uh, the, the, the fish on the back of the car and they say, we are Christians. But when you look at their life, their life looks just like the world. Their lives blend in, and you look at them, and you can't tell the difference between them and someone who was lost without Christ. And you have this idea that Christians are blending in with the world. They have become ordinary, just the same as the rest of the sinful world. And in today's passage, we're going to see what it means to truly live as God's people whose lives stand out and shine in the midst 
of a dark world. If you have your Bibles with you this morning or you have your phones, whatever cool thing you have, uh, you can turn to Matthew chapter 5. It will also be on the screens if you don't have any of those. And so we're going to dive in. And, and it's interesting that the, the way that the writer puts these into place is he talks about being a peacemaker. And then immediately after being a peacemaker follows these words. And Jesus says this, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and utter uh, and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In verse 10, Jesus gives us the last of the Beatitudes. We've looked at a bunch at the beginning of this series. And this is the last one. And if you notice, the reward for being persecuted is exactly the same as the reward for blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Right? So he starts off with the Beatitudes with the reward being the kingdom of heaven. He ends this beati- the last Beatitude with the reward being for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you might say, well, well, why is he doing that? Why is the author of Matthew doing that? What he's doing is showing that this, the, this body of verses is giving one common theme, one common purpose. It's a literary unit where it has a purpose for why these things are lumped together. And here it is, that God's people will be God's people. Does that make sense? And so you have these beatitudes that God's people will be God's people. So they're lumped together together with this reward being the kingdom of heaven. And this morning we're going to unpack three powerful truths from these three verses. And I put the first one in, in your notes this way. I put it like this. I said the message of the kingdom. And as we go through this, I want you guys to understand that we're going to have to back up and get a big picture. Before we go right into persecution, we have to understand the message of God's kingdom. And, and as I was studying this passage and I was jumping into it, we could be simple, we could be like churches who don't like to go deep, and I could just give you a very superficial teaching of persecution. But we're not about that. We don't want to tickle ears. We want to teach. We want to show. We want to unlock the truths that are locked into God's word. And so we're going to have to kind of do a little bit of digging deep. Are you guys with me? And so understand, when, you, when I'm talking about the message of the kingdom, we're going to have to set the tone so we can finish with what Jesus means by being persecuted. And so we're going to dig. We're going to go through scripture. We're going to unpack it. But I tell you, it is worth the wait. You with me? All right. Well, let's get started. Here it goes. It it says the message of the kingdom. Uh, When Jesus began his earthly ministry, Jesus went around from village to village, went around to synagogues, went around to homes, from home to homes, preaching and teaching and proclaiming a specific message. His message is that there is going to be, uh, and when he, says, when he talks about this, he says there is a, uh, yet we have to understand that he was living in a Jewish culture. And sometimes when we read this, we, we sit back and we try to put our modern day thinking into a passage. But to understand the context, we have to sit back and understand that Jesus was living in a Jewish culture. He was teaching in a Jewish culture. He was a part of that Jewish culture. And and the message he was going pertained to the hope that Israel had in God. You see, during this time, you have to remember, the Israelites were being oppressed by the Roman Empire. They didn't have a land their own. They were slaves to this. They didn't have the freedoms. They weren't living as God's people as they should be. They weren't experiencing all of his blessings. They were locked up in this place. Of, they were in, pretty much in exile, waiting for this God to come and save them. And so there was this hope that Israel was clinging to. There was this hope that as they endured this moment of oppression, they had this hope that they could look at and say, because of this hope, I can get through this oppression. And you might say, well, Brad, what is that hope? And many, many of us are quick to say, I know what the hope is. The hope is that when they die, they go to heaven. But for, for, for these Jewish people in the first century, that was not, their hope wasn't just when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. That wasn't their only hope. And that's not the only hope that we have. N.T. Wright says this. He goes, this is what the hope was 
for first century Jews. He says it this way. Their hope was simply, uh, when it talks about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, it says, it was simply a Jewish way of talking about Israel's God becoming king. And when this God became king, the whole world, the world of space and time, would at last be put to rights. Here's what it's saying. Israel longed for the day that their God would come and reign as king. And when he came to reign as king, he would defeat their enemies. And in this case, the Jews were looking at it as, hey, we need these pagan Romans to get out of our land. And so they were hoping that God would come as king, defeat the Romans, and bring them into the land that God had promised to them, where he would dwell in Zion, he would dwell in the temple, where they would have the presence of God, and finally our hope would be realized. That was the hope that the first century Jews held on to. Jesus walks onto the scene, and he begins to preach and begins to teach. In Mark 1.15, this is what Jesus says. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Can you imagine the emotions that would be stirred amongst the Jewish culture? The kingdom of God is here. God has come. He's going to reign as king. He's going to defeat the Romans. This is amazing. And this is the message Jesus began to teach. But yet Jesus, the message he had about the kingdom of God was not like what the Israel expected, nor was it what they had liked it to be. This morning we're going to examine two parts of his message as they pertain to Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. The first way I put it in your notes is this. The first thing is, Jesus is king. It's the first part of his message. Jesus said, come on to the scene, began to teach people that the kingdom of God was here. Repent and believe. God's kingdom has come. And as you look throughout scripture, Jesus had set him up in three separate ways. He came as a prophet. And over and over again in scripture, you could see where even the Jews, the religious leaders who didn't want to believe in him, they said, man, is this some kind of prophet? Like, who is this guy? And over and over you see where Jesus was called or identified as a prophet of God. And even uh, Jesus, he says, when he went to Nazareth, his own hometown, and when he was rejected by the people at Nazareth, this is what he says, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. So Jesus came to be the new prophet. And not only that, but there is very similar parallels, significant parallels between Moses as the prophet and Jesus as the prophet. If you remember Moses, Moses went up on the mountain to get the what? To get the law. To tell people, here's how God has called us to live. Jesus, when he's delivering this sermon on the mount, telling his disciples, here is the way of the kingdom, Jesus was teaching on a mount. And there's many more parallels we could go into. But Jesus has established himself as the new prophet of Israel. But not only that, uh, he also declared himself as the Messiah. You guys remember John the Baptist from the Gospels, right? He gets thrown into prison. And Jesus is going around doing many mighty works. He's performing miracles. People are blown away. Word gets back to John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is like, man, i got to find out. Is this the Messiah? Is this the one who was to come? So he sends some messengers out to Jesus. And Jesus uh, hears them and then responds to them. And he says, look, this is what I want you to tell John the Baptist. And the words Jesus uses, he, he quotes from Isaiah. And he says this, the blind receive their sight and the lame walk, lepers are clean, cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. John the Baptist would understand that this passage is referring to the Messiah, the one who would come and redeem Israel. And Jesus declared himself as the Messiah. In addition to be declaring himself as the prophet of the Messiah, he also came as king. Now, you could search the scriptures 
in the New Testament, and you can see, where does Jesus say, I am king? You won't find that declaration. And there was a reason for that. If you look for, why, did not, why didn't Jesus come out and say, I'm the king of the universe? You have to remember, he was on a mission. And if he was to publicly come out and say, I am king, Caesar would have a problem with it, right? Because he was the Roman emperor. You'd also have King Herod, who would have a problem with that. Wait, I'm the king of the Jews. What do you mean you're king? And his ministry could have been cut very short. You with me? And so Jesus doesn't come out and, and publicly declare, I am king. But that's why he, he is very discreet in what he does. That's why he uses parables, so that people could hear but not understand. Right? He uses parables to hide it. He sends these words to John the Baptist. He doesn't say, hey, I'm the Messiah. He sends words that John the Baptist would see that he is the Messiah. But there was a very clear and direct act where God defined, where Jesus defined himself as king. You guys remember the story where Jesus walked into the temple and saw a bunch of traders there, people selling everything. And you see that Jesus sees all this stuff going on, turns over the tables, takes out the whip. I don't know what he did with the whip, but he turned the tables over, got out the whip, and he says, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of robbers. Notice, interestingly, he said, my house. You see, king, royalty for the Jews was wrapped up in the temple. The only one who could restore and rebuild the temple to what it should be was the king. And here Jesus comes onto the scene and says, get out. My house is a house of prayer. I'm going to restore and rebuild the purpose of this temple. You guys remember the stories too where Jesus said, I'm going to destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it back up again. You see how all perplexed the Jews were? What do you mean? Jesus, what are you saying? How can you tear it down and build it up? It took forever to build. Jesus, how are you going to do this? What Jesus is doing is, is, is him declaring that he is king. Not just prophet, not just Messiah, but he is the king ushering in the kingdom of God. And in Jesus' kingdom, in his message, he wasn't coming to destroy Israel's enemy, the Romans. His kingdom was coming to destroy their real enemy, our real enemy, Satan and sin. The Jews thought he was going to come to rescue them from Roman oppression, but he came to rescue them from their sin, their shame, and from Satan, their enemy. Jesus' message was radical to the first century Jews. Jesus ushered in a kingdom that was totally different than what they expected. But not only is Jesus king, but here's the next thing I put in your notes. Israel is to be the light. We have to remember that as Jesus was delivering this sermon on the mount, he was speaking to his disciples who were Jews. And basically what Jesus is telling them is, hey, you guys, I'm ushering in the kingdom. You are the new Israel. You are going to carry out the true purpose that should have been played out by Israel all along. And he gives them this new identity. Now you might be saying, well, Brett, why are you saying Israel is to be the light? Where do you get that from? I don't see that in Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Well, if you look at Matthew 5, 14, we're not going to go in too depth into Matthew 5, 14 because that will happen next week. But I, want you, I, I can't divorce Matthew 10 to 12 from Matthew 14. These verses tie together, and so these, there's overlapping here. But I want you to look at Matthew 5, 14. This is what Jesus says, talking to his disciples, these Jews. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. What's the idea? Here Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Is that Jesus' disciples should live out the message of the kingdom, they should live as his people so that when people would examine their lives and hear their message and see the way that they're living, that in hope they would give glory to God their Father through what God was doing in and through them. The idea of being a light is not just unique to Jesus' disciples. It wasn't just something that Jesus pulled out of thin air and said, you know what, it would be really good for me to say, Israel, be the light. 
He got it from somewhere. Well, where did he get it from? Well, the idea is this, is that Israel all along was to be the light. They were to be a light to a lost and hurting world. They were to be a light to those who were in darkness. They were to be a light to other nations. In Isaiah chapter 60, look at what these verses say. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will, will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your what? Light. And kings to the brightness of your rising. See, Israel was to be a light to the nations, but we don't have to stop there. We can go even further back than Isaiah. We can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12. You guys remember a guy named Abraham? Remember how Abraham was called out to leave his country, right? And, and he says, I want you to go and lead to another country. And then here's what God tells him. In verse 1 it says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. Now check, check this. And I will make of you a great nation. That's awesome. I will bless you and make your name great. Hey, we're doing good so far. So that you will be a blessing. A blessing to who? My family? A blessing to my neighbors? Who am I a blessing to? Verse 3. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. They were to be a blessing to other nations. They were not to be just a blessing amongst themselves. Over and over and over again you see Israel not living out the blessing to other nations. They were not living out being the light. If you look at their lives you see what happened. Many of them became just like the world, right? Right? I mean, Moses is up on the mountain and the, and the Israelites are dancing around a cow. Like, what just happened? You're supposed to be God's people. You're down here worshiping a calf. They're becoming just like the nations around them. Others of them said, you know what? We don't really like these other nations. They're kind of bad and evil. They're different than us. You know, we don't, we, they're naughty and they don't do stuff we do. So we're just going to make a little box around our religion and <laughs> we're right you're wrong, and sorry, you're not a Jew, you're not a Pharisee, you're not a Sadducee, you're not an Essene, so guess what? We don't care about you. And they created this exclusive religion. And God's kingdom was never about that. God's kingdom was about his people being the light, living as the light, proclaiming the message that God, the king, has come, his kingdom is here, and if you repent and believe in it, you will be a part of his kingdom and their lives would reflect that. You see, church, I think if we were to pause and take a moment of gut check for ourselves, we could look across churches in America, we could look across churches in the state of Florida, in Broward and Day counties, in the city of Hollywood, and here's what we can find. We have people that claim Christ as their savior, but deny him with their behavior, do we not? Instead of being the light, we love the darkness. We have Christians that claim Christ, yet believe sex before marriage is perfectly fine. Claim Christ, yet actively engage in pornography. Claim Christ, yet party hard until they're drunk. Claim Christ, yet engage in drug activity because, hey, we're just having fun. Claim Christ, but they believe there are many ways to heaven. God doesn't really say there's only one way. That's rude. It's exclusive. How dare God? There are many that claim Christ but say, hey, same-sex marriages, those honor God. doesn't matter. Everyone should be free to love. Claim Christ, yet they hold on to racism. Claim Christ, but yet they gossip more than the View TV show. Amen? Claim Christ, yet commit, commit adultery. Come on, Brad, variety is the spice of life. No, it's darkness. All of it's darkness. Not one bit of that is light. And God says, Israel, church, we are to be the light, not just in word, but in deed. Because our lives should shine around to those who are in darkness. So they could see the light and in hopes they would say, what is different about you? And you say, it is because Christ is king and I pledge my loyalty to him that they might have the opportunity to sit back and say, Christ is king in my life 
as well. That's how we are to be a blessing to others. But we ruin that blessing, that opportunity, when we choose to live like the rest of the world. You see, the message we proclaim is this. God has ushered in his kingdom through Jesus Christ. And anyone who places their trust in him will be set free from their sins and ushered in to God's kingdom. Jesus challenges us to be the light. Here's the second thing I put in your notes. We have the message of the kingdom, but then we have the reaction to the message. Because there will be a reaction to our message. And in, and in today's purposes, we're going to look at the one aspect of the message. And this is as it relates to persecution. Matthew 5, 10 says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so you have this idea of persecution. The word persecute literally means to pursue, to chase. So what does this mean? Is that as we proclaim the message of Christ, there are going to be people whose sole goal is to pursue us, to chase us, to quiet us, to make us be quiet, to squash out our message with whatever means necessary. And that pursue means it's active. It's ongoing. There will never be a point until Jesus returns that people will not persecute this message. Next thing I put in your notes is this. Persecutions expected. Persecutions should be expected. It should not be a surprise. We are to expect the persecutions. They will hate our message of the kingdom. You might say, Brad, why do they hate our message? Well, the reason why they hate our message is because we, ha- we are telling people, you have to give up your right to dictate how you live your life. That the life you live now for yourself in whatever way possible leads to one place, leads to destruction and hell. And people don't want to give up. We like to do what we like to do. We are sinners and sinful at heart, and we want to do every evil desire that we can do. The Bible says the heart is exceedingly wicked above all things. And so when you tell somebody, hey, you have to give up yourself to follow Jesus, the king, people will hate that message. Look at the world today. Just go to CNN once or twice a week and see what are happening to Christians across the world. Look at how terrorists are going in, taking Christians, gathering up, killing them, executing them just because they believe in Jesus Christ. What what are they doing? They hate the Christian message. The Christian message says your God is not God. Our God is the one true king and people will hate you for that message. And Jesus says persecutions are to be expected. 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul says this, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be what? No questions. It's not a maybe, it's not an if, it's just a matter of when you will be persecuted. John 16, 33, Jesus says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Persecutions are coming. Remember who's your king though. Peter, Jesus' disciple, says in 1 Peter 4, 12, Beloved, Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange was happening to you. What are these verses saying? People will hate our message, not love it. There are some who will love it, and next week Pastor Brian will get into that. But for today's purpose, people will hate our message. The question that we have to sit back and think, and here's a gut check question. Do we find ourselves popular Amongst the lost. Do we find people that test us, that question us? Because because if we just blend in and we don't have anybody questioning our message, we're not giving them the true message. Because Jesus says he will pit father against mother, against son, against daughter, that there will be this division because of the message. So if your life is only you're loved by everybody, there's something wrong with your message. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying go out and find a way to get persecuted. That's not what Brad is saying. What I'm saying is as you are sharing the message of Christ's kingdom with other people, some will accept it, but many will reject it. And so persecutions are to be expected. And you could show somebody 
an act of God, and they will still hate your message. How do I know that? I came across while studying a guy named Polycarp. He was a disciple of John the Apostle. And it says that he was sentenced to death for his message because he would not quit preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it says that right as he was getting ready to get executed, they were going to burn him at the stake. He was like, you don't have to nail me to this pole. Just, I will stand here and take the burning. God will allow me this enough strength to be able to stand here and not have to be tied down with your nails. And so as he was getting ready to light, as they were getting ready to light the fire, he stood there, began to pray. Prayed that God would be with him and thanking God that he was able to share the cup of suffering just as Christ had shared. And what goes on, what happens is they lit the fire, and the fire lit, but it kind of created an arch, and none of the flames were touching him. It was a miraculous moment, an act of God before their very eyes. And you think that people would be like, wow, that's pretty cool. Like, did you see the fire? What's going on right now? Like, this guy prayed, and look what's happening. Wow, you know what? Take out the fire. That's not what happened. There was a guy who hated the message, took a spear, and killed him. A very act of God does not mean people are going to accept your message. They will reject it because they are blinded to the truth. They don't know God. Persecutions are to be expected. Not only are persecutions to be expected, but here we go. Persecutions are varied. Matthew 5.11 says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Persecutors, persecutors are kind of like stalkers. They plot, they plan, they organize. They find all sorts of ways to try to deter your message, to keep you off track. They'll use slander, spread lies about you. Look at the early church, right? As soon as the, when Rome went under fire and caught on fire, who got blamed for the fire in Rome? Christians did. And the Christ, Christians have nothing to do with the fire. But the Romans said, you know what? We hate their message, take them out. Christians did it. So people are willing to slander you. They're willing to throw you under the bus, say all kinds of evil against you because they hate your message. Not only that, but you have people that were thrown into prison and beaten for their faith in Jesus Christ. And ultimately you have people that paid the ultimate price and shared in the cup of suffering just like Christ who were killed for their faith. But the thing we know about our God, about our message, is that our message will never die out. People have tried to squash it out since Jesus proclaimed this message. And it has not died, has not been squashed. Why? Because Jesus himself even said that the gates of hell could not prevail against his church, his bride. They can try to crush us. They can try to stomp us out. They can try to destroy us. But Jesus' message will live on because it is the true message of God. Persecutions will come in a variety of ways, but the motivation to endure the persecution is always the same. This is the third thing I put in your notes. The reward for enduring persecution. The reward for enduring persecution. Matthew 5.10 says, Those who are persecuted, blessed are those who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 12 says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Our reward, first thing you notice right after that is this, inherit the kingdom. That's our first reward, inherit the kingdom. When we suffer persecution, when we endure to the end, our motivation is we do inherit the kingdom. We know that one day we will obtain the resurrection just like Jesus. We know that when we put our faith in Christ, even if they were to kill us, just like Paul says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. That as I endure, it doesn't matter what they do to me here on earth, I will be present with my Savior, my King. As we stay this, the course, as we look to the prize, we can endure all persecutions no matter what kind. 2 Timothy 4, 6 8, the Apostle Paul said it this way, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. 
the Apostle Paul looked to the reward for his motivation. He looked and said, I know what I'm going to get in glory far outweighs the moment of suffering I endure on earth. Picture it, a year, two, three years compared to eternal glory in heaven forever. It is not too small a price to pay to endure persecution when you know what's waiting for you in glory. There's a story of, uh, uh, of, of, the, of the apostles in Acts chapter 5. Because Jesus says, rejoice and be glad during your suffering. And that's kind of hard, right? Because normally in suffering, we want to take the self-pity. We want, oh, why is this happening to me? I don't understand. Oh, these people are so rude. They're mean. I can't believe. And we kind of take this pity. But the apostles understood that it is rejoicing. And there's a story where the apostles were preaching the gospel of Christ. They were told to stop and they wouldn't. Because the message was inside of them. And the message was burning inside of them. They couldn't stop. And so they were beaten before a council. It says they were flogged. And the idea of flogging is they were beaten or whipped with 39 lashes of a whip. Where their back would be open. They're bleeding. They're cut up. And all this stuff. They get beaten. They're released. And look at what it says in Acts chapter 5 verse 41. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Come again? They were beaten and they went out rejoicing, saying, thank you, God, that we were able to share in the suffering that you endured. And verse 42, and I love this, and every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. They did not let the beatings deter them from the message, deter them from being the light. It only spurred them on further to even more be the light. So when persecution comes, rejoice in it and be even more steadfast in being the light. There's a cool story of Elizabeth Elliot. Her husband was Jim Elliott, and they were missionaries to Ecuador. Her husband was killed by the people they were sharing the gospel with. And she had this, she had this amazing quote that she was able to look at her reward in heaven. And this is what she had to say. We have proved beyond any doubt that he means what he says. His grace is sufficient. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. We pray that if any, anywhere, are fearing that the cost of discipleship is too great, that they may be given to glimpse that treasure in heaven promised to all who forsake. If you keep your eyes on the prize, you will endure persecution no matter how much you have to pay. Here's the second thing I put in your notes. Not only do we have a reward in heaven where we inherit the kingdom, but also we will be joined with the prophets. Matthew 5.12 says this, For so they persecuted the prophets who came before you. We can rejoice in suffering because we will join great company when we suffer for the sake of the gospel. Think of the prophets who suffered as God's prophets. Isaiah, who was sawn in two. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. You have Daniel and David who suffered persecution at the hands of the world. There's a few modern day ones I'd like to share. Some of them are a few hundred years ago, so it's not really that modern. But um, one of them is named Hugh McHale in 1666. He was given four days to live before he would be put to death. And it says while he was marching back to prison, he saw one of his friends along the way. And he called out to him and he said, good news, wonderful news. In four days, I'm going to be in the presence of my Savior, Jesus. Who speaks like this? It's people who know the reward is in heaven, who know that they're in the line of great company. There's a a guy, Jim Elliott, the one who was martyred. He said this, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Karen Watson, she was a missionary to Iraq who was gunned down in Iraq by the people she was sharing the gospel with. She wrote a letter to her pastor and it said this, you're only reading this if I died. Catch this, to obey was my objective. To suffer was expected. His glory, my reward. So she was willing to die for her faith in Christ. Our very own missionary, Mike Rittering, had this to say. If we lost everything, even our own lives, we've gained everything in heaven. This is something to look forward to. Can you live your life like that? 
To live is Christ and to die is gain. I embrace that. I love that. How cool is our God if he can give us this, that if we die, this is gain. What else do we have to be afraid of? Jesus is the greatest example. Hebrews 12.2 says this, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Who for the joy before him endured the cross. You see, persecutions are going to come as you live as Israel, as you live out the light, and as you share the message of Jesus' kingdom. Persecutions will come in all forms and fashions, but count it joy because great is your reward. But not only that, you join the long line of people, God's prophets, God's people, who have shared in the same suffering as Christ did to proclaim that God the king has come. He will vindicate us. He gives us the ultimate victory, which is victory over sin and death. I want you to bow your hearts with me this morning. Jesus gives his disciples the challenge. Israel, be the light in word and deed. And share the message of my kingdom. Let people know that there is light in the dark. Let people know that they don't have to stay broken. Let people know they don't have to do life on their own and suffer and hurt and shame and guilt. Let people know that there is a father in heaven who loves them despite what they've done. Let them know that there is hope, there is forgiveness, there is peace that passes all understanding if they would only look to Christ. And Jesus has entrusted us with his mission that we live our lives in such a way that we don't resemble the rest of the world, that we say we love the light, we hate the dark, we want to rescue as many people in the dark as possible. So I'm choosing to give up addictions, pornography, sex, whatever it is, so that I could be the light so someone could know Jesus Christ. Because catch this, you don't just stay in one place your whole life. You guys are out everywhere amongst the world, the lost, at stores, at restaurants, at your children's activities, and you have the opportunity to be the light, to point someone to Christ and tell them, this is why I'm different. This is why I don't get out and party on the weekends, because Christ is in me. Christ has changed me. Christ is enough. And the first question for each of us that we need to answer is, Christ enough? Because if Christ is not enough, you won't live as the light. You'll live as the dark. But when Christ becomes enough, you'll shine bright for him. You will be a city set on a hill where people would look at you and say, what is that about you? And you say, that's my savior. Let me tell you about him. Let me tell you about him. He's king. His kingdom's here. He reigns. Forgiveness is yours. Will you be the light? God in heaven, we thank you for your word. God, your word speaks so powerfully to us because it shows us who we really are. And God, I love it because as we open up your word and sometimes when we get it off the path, you remind us where our lives should be. That our lives should be put at the mercy of your grace, saying, God, I can't live out these beatitudes on my own. I need your grace to change it so I can be your people, so that I can be your light. God, change me. Transform my heart, my mind, renew it so that I care about you and love you above all things. And God, when those persecutions come, I know you'll give me the strength to stand tall because you have overcome the world. Even if they take my life, 
that's gained to me because I'm in your presence forevermore. God, I pray for all of us in here this morning that we would see the challenge that you've given to us to finally be your true people who live as the light to a lost and hurting world. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.